been listening to coverage from our KCBS station out in L.A. We want to get straight to Steve Moore. He's a former FBI agent. He is in Thousand Oaks, California. Uh, Steve, uh, we've heard from the school officials that this is an unprecedented uh, action that they've taken here to close all the schools in the Los Angeles uh, uh, school district. We're talking about 700,000 students. What do you make of what they are saying is a credible threat? And what the Associated Press is saying is a law enforcement that told them that this threat may have been an email threat from overseas. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I'm troubled by, by how they're defining credible threat, especially if it's coming from overseas. Um, the LAUSD it would be uh, a very, uh, very obvious target to anybody overseas because it's one of the biggest school districts in the world. Um, the terrorist groups that I've seen and the terrorist modus operandi I've seen is not to warn beforehand. They want they want body counts. They don't want uh, they don't want people to be able to defend against them. Um, so I, I again I'm not criticizing the the school closures. I don't know what their threat is, but eventually we're going to have to come up with a protocol where we just where we decide that we're not going to give them freebies. They can, if they can close school for 70,000 or 700,000 kids just by a phone call or an email, then they own us. You know, I'm sure there are specific factors that are required before you can call something a credible threat. But I wonder if also just the nature of the times right now, the fact that we're, uh, you know, dealing with the San Bernardino shooting that's still under investigation, if that sort of alters what you consider a credible threat. It's going to certainly move credible uh, uh, closer to uh, um, closer to actionable. Or uh, I, I think what it's doing is something that might be credible is now considered completely credible. Um, and, and for credible, we always we always looked at uh, factors like: Do they know something about the individual target? Do they do they discuss weaponry or? Um, an actual event which which indicates planning or knowledge. So again, I would like to know uh, this what this threat is. But you're right; things that would not be credible at other times are more credible now out of an abundance of caution. And Stephen, it's something that you sort of said in your first response to my question. I, I, and I wonder what kind of protocols should we be looking to have in place for the situation, the environment that we're currently living in right now? Because clearly, if the intention is by the Islamic State or whoever would uh, do us harm, that we, that we sort of scatter any time there's any kind of threat made to one of our institutions, uh, I don't know if that's sustainable, because you're talking about millions of dollars and uh, millions of hours of, man, of resources and manpower being put into uh, trying to ferret out this threat. So what should we be thinking about? What should our elected officials be thinking about going forward in this new environment that we're in? It, well, you're right. It is a new environment. And um, what you're going to have to, what we're going to have to come up with as a nation is a set of, a set of uh, parameters by which we would call something um, uh, credible. For instance, you Long ago, we, we started dealing with bomb threats. I mean, bomb threats get called in every day to schools and churches around the country, and we don't close them. It's because we've learned that 99 and uh, greater percent of them are, are complete fabrications. But now, if you get a call from somebody or an email from somebody who might be overseas in a scary area, now we say, oh, we will close the schools. We're going to have to go back and start vetting these the way we vet anything else and, and try, to, try to keep our wits about us on these. Steve, I have a follow-up question on that. So and, and you, you probably won't want to divulge all the specifics that the FBI and our federal law enforcement agencies utilize in trying to discern whether a threat is credible or not. But you said something interesting, which is that uh, very long ago, the FBI figured out how to discern credible bomb threats, for example, from those that are not credible. For example, we know that the president of the United States is probably threatened on a regular basis and that the FBI and the Treasury Department investigate each of those threats, but they are not always made public because... 99, uh, you know, one out of, uh, very rarely are these threats 
actually credible. And so I wonder, what are some of the parameters that the FBI uses in determining whether or not a threat, whether it's a bomb threat, whether it's a threat to an elected official or to an institution is credible? Well, what we would, I, I, I can't discuss everything we would look at, but we would look at planning. We would look at obvious planning, knowledge of the target. We would, uh, you know, the, the, an, over, an overgeneralized example would be, uh, yeah, we know that this teacher drives a white, white Camry to school every day and parks in this spot. That's where we're going to start our attack. Well, if there is a teacher like that, you know somebody's case the place. So that indicates pre-planning. Um, absent that, you know, the, at the opposite end of the scale is there's a bomb in one of your schools today. Click. Well, that indicates no pre-planning. You don't have to have any knowledge for that, and anybody could make it. Uh, so what you're looking for are threats that would be indicators of an actionable, uh, of an actionable type. Can you talk to me a little bit about the difficulty in protecting uh, uh, schools. I mean, these are places that, though they're security, they're meant to be open. They're meant to allow for students to come and go and, and parents to come and visit. That's got to present an incredible challenge. Yeah, I, I think that's one of the one of the big things we're going to be wrestling with for the next few years. Uh, and God forbid, you know, anything ever happens at a school. But in the in the past uh, couple of decades, I mean, when I went to school, you just it was it was an open campus. Anybody could be on campus, and there were no doors locked. Um, with the school shootings that we've seen, uh, you, you're finding campuses that are fenced in, locked in, um, and so it's you can get out, but you can't get in so much. And I think that's where we're going to have to go. It's a new world. We used to be able to just uh, walk from uh, walk from your car to the plane. Uh, you can't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, Stephen, uh, I know that, um, for example, in the state of Israel, they're always on heightened alert because they are surrounded by their enemies. Are there any lessons that the United States can, can take from what that country is doing in protecting its citizens uh, that we can apply here? Because obviously they are threatened almost every single day, uh, but yet their citizens are able to go about and live a semi, I mean, an almost normal life uh, without occasional spikes in violence. Are there any lessons to be drawn from what the state of Israel is doing that we can apply here? Well, you, you make a good point. You always look at somebody who's already been through what you're going through. And Israel uh, goes through this all the time. If you don't think they have bomb threats at their school all the time, um, th then, then we're naive. And once, once the, the people who would do this learn that they're not going to jump um, when they call, and again, I'm not criticizing LAUSD. I don't know what information they have. But uh, then those calls stop coming. And um, I don't think it's, uh, it's a great secret that the FBI and other organizations um, interact uh, frequently <clears throat> excuse me, with, the, uh, with the Israelis to learn how they're dealing with their particular threat scenarios. It's going to strike you, though, as odd that the FBI is getting involved in this threat. It, it, the superintendent mentioned that they get threats all the time. We know that it's a finals now and, it, you know, anything's possible. But the fact that the FBI is assisting must be significant. I think that's, um, I think that's a, a normal um, fallout from what's been going on lately. I, I ran uh, the al-Qaeda part of this terrorism task force that they'd be dealing with. And if the LAUSD feels that it's a credible threat and brings it to the attention of the FBI, that indicates to me that, yeah, there is something in here besides there's a bomb and click. Um, there's got to be something that is concerning them. Uh, th there, there is something about this threat that is either specific enough or troubling enough that they um, that they took these actions. And the FBI is not going to uh, generally recommend closing schools or not closing schools, but they will discuss with uh, the school their, their belief on threat level, uh, and the school can either take their advice or not. 
All right, Stephen, uh, stand by. I think uh, we want to bring in uh, another uh, voice here to uh, beef up this discussion a little. Brian Levin, he's at the Cal State San Bernardino Criminal Justice. Uh, he's a former uh, NYPD police officer. He's joining us also on the phone. Uh, Brian, thanks for being with us. W what do you make of this, uh, this threat that is being deemed credible by the Los Angeles uh, School District? Well, look, we haven't, had, we haven't heard all the details, but couple things. First, the timing. The timing of this coming right after the, the tragedy in San Bernardino. Also, uh, they have a regional threat management entity here called the JREC, which uh, is a law enforcement consortium and an intel consortium. Uh, so what happens is when something like this gets called in, they don't make this decision just by themselves. They get the help of this regional consortium, which includes FBI, and they're going to err on the side of safety. This is unprecedented, though. We're talking about 643,000 students, an area about twice the size of New York City, about 720 square miles. So uh, we're talking about a big shutdown here, the second biggest in the nation. And what we have to worry about on the other side of this, though, is how it may embolden other people. Remember one thing, though. Almost all the time, these things are hoaxes. Almost all the time, these things are hoaxes. But by the same token, in the environment we are in now, I think it was a very prudent decision for what the authorities did in, in shutting the school down. You can always make up a day. You can always give a test later. But if there was some kind of uh, explosive device, which is what is reportedly been part of the threat, and some backpacks, which is, again, reported but unconfirmed, this is the way to do it. And it's going to be a massive search. Uh, you're talking about all these school lockers throughout a huge district far flung uh, across the whole city. I got to wonder, though, Brian, is, is, is this going to be the new norm that we're looking mm -hmm. at, that we jump every time something like this comes through? Maybe, maybe not. And, and here's what I mean. Uh, you know what? Fool me once, uh, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. What the school district, school district is getting to do now is actually kind of a dry run. And they'll, uh, they'll develop certain protocols with regard to handling uh, threats in the future and how to evaluate them. Because this wasn't specifically about just one or two or three schools. It was about many schools. I think with the timing and with the intelligence flow that these folks have at their disposal, it's, it's better to err on the side of safety. And, yeah, are you going to embolden hoaxers? Sure. Are you going to embolden evildoers? Absolutely. But the bottom line is uh, you, if you have a choice and you've got to make a decision, you do it on the side of safety. Uh, this is what happened when, when I was in the NYPD and we would get, uh, like, a bomb threat. But what would happen is it would be much more localized to a particular building. Uh, this, uh, this is a much more broad, uh, massive kind of closure. Steve, I want to go back to you, and I want to talk about the uh, the nature of this threat and how it was received. Uh, the school officials saying that it was an electronic message sent to them. Now, again, in this day and age, you kind of think to yourself, well, if you're going to want to cause some kind of mayhem, you want to, you want to uh, hurt people, uh, you're generally not going to warn them. But if you do decide to warn them, it would seem to me that email would be the easiest way that you would get caught. Uh, well, yes and no. Uh, the way things are going with uh, encryption these days, and uh, uh, they, they can send their they can send their messages and bounce them through Turkey, Kazakhstan, the whole bit, and and it, it takes it takes years to unravel them if you can. Uh, and and I wanted to comment on something that I agree with with your other guest. The um, the, there is a learning curve here, and what today might be a school closure, a prudent school closure, might not be tomorrow because we have learned from this. So if this is, and I believe it will be, these are smart people we're dealing with in L.A. They're not, they're not you know, going to jump off the handle here. Uh, you will learn, and you will get better, and there's institutional knowledge uh, so that uh, the same threat is, is properly uh, addressed the next time you get it. Steve, I'm wondering how well trained are, are the LA school, are, are members of the LA school police department? You know, you think about a school district police department, you think about a resource officer, somebody who may, may see, basically, you know, checks the students when they come in, maybe. Are they trained to deal with this level of threat? Absolutely, they are. The, um, the LA USD schools uh, are, are, sworn police officers, just like LAPD, 
They get uh, a lot of the same training. They get much specific training for the schools. Um, I'm familiar with some of their uh, leadership, and I think that they are very good at what they do. And, and a school resource officer, though they may be in soft clothes, uh, are certainly going to be armed and, and uh, ready for this. And, and, uh, um, and, I'm, and I'm waiting for calls from Jay Rick this morning. In fact, I got one and I didn't answer it. Now I wish I had. <laughs> Brian, let me ask you, um, we uh, are also being told, and the NYPD has tweeted this out, that uh, the NYPD, uh, the New York School District received a non-credible threat to NYC schools that were made today. There is that tweet, Justin, there was a specific but non-credible threat made to NYC schools this morning. Commissioner Bratton uh, is uh, making some comments as we speak right now, and there we see another tweet. We don't see this as a credible terrorist threat. So again, I guess we, 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 we're trying to figure out for our audience here uh, the differences in how law enforcement uh, agencies look at the credible threats versus the non-credible threats. Here again, you see another tweet. These threats are made to promote fear. This is from Commissioner Bratton himself. We cannot allow us to raise the levels. We are very comfortable that this is not a credible threat concerned with people overreacting to this, says Commissioner Bratton. Working closely with the FBI, Joint Terrorism Task Force, and the LAPD on this threat. Again, signed from Commissioner Bratton himself. So, so again, you're seeing two uh, contrast approaches to uh, to this th th these threats here by the uh, nation's two largest cities, essentially, uh, one in New York, one in LA. Uh, what do you make of that? Uh, I was sorry, I was talking to Brian. Yeah, well, you know, look, here's the thing. We don't know uh, the threat that L.A. got versus the threat that New York got. So, um, and uh, New York came on the heels of, uh, of L.A. Um, remember also, though, okay, New York is a much more densely populated city where, where you can allocate resources across a geographic area when there's not a lot of traffic a little bit quicker. Uh, so uh, we don't know whether or not New York's was regarded as more of a copycat. We don't know if there were details in the New York threat that were different from the one in L.A., uh, you, you can't <laughs> you can't really compare apples and oranges, but but I do think that most of these are are, are hoaxes, okay? But the bottom line is, you know, uh, it's not that hard to uh, make an explosive device. So what you what you want to do is, if the atmospherics, if you will. OK, uh, the, the chatter that you have coming in, the experts that you have who are analyzing the threat, where the threat came from uh, and what efforts there are to verify it, as well as the time frame you have. Maybe the New York City schools were already open. It would be more disruptive um, to a variety of factors, not all of which we are cognizant of. So I think both folks and I'm former NYPD, both folks, I think, probably acted on the best info they can. Um, I, I do think I'm not I'm just not going to criticize the, the L.A. people for shutting down the school, um, even if uh, Commissioner Bratt in New York made a separate decision, because the situations and the facts underlying the different choices may very well be different, especially this, the one in New York might just be regarded as a copycat. Yeah, I find it interesting that we're having this discussion, you know, at the same time that the Department of Homeland Security has announced changes to the terror alert system. And those changes are sort of reducing the level instead of requiring a credible and specific threat to raise the alarm, uh, sort of lowering that threshold in the interest of public safety. Uh, Steve, I want to sort of bounce that off of you. Are we in a, a place right now where we're, we're sort of redefining what a threat is and and how to handle that. I think we are, but I'm not sure it's the wisest thing to do. I mean, we've been dealing with threats of all types now uh, um, for for decades, and to change our um, to change our fences when uh, when the cow leans against them is not the wisest thing to do, in in my personal opinion. Um, and as Brian says, I. I I think New York schools had a different set of circumstances than L.A. did, but I'm going to be very curious as to how the threat differed and whether they believe the threat came from the same source. Uh, if it did come from the same source, then you're not talking about something that's as credible. And, uh, again, I'm not criticizing L.A. Uh, I'm a big fan of uh, Chief Bratton, 
Uh, and so I, I think everybody's doing what they're what is prudent at this moment, but we were going to need to learn from each one of these situations. And as far as what Homeland Security has done, I think it's a dangerous precedent, dangerous in that you're giving a terrorist, potential terrorist, more control by lowering our threshold to react to something. I mean, it's kind of like the kid who who gets who uh, the bully who beats up a kid the first day of the school year and gets his lunch money without touching him the rest of the year we can't live that way yeah i mean uh according to uh, reports that i'm seeing right now uh this press conference that uh, commissioner Bratton was at he was accompanied there by mayor bill de blasio uh according to them there were numerous school districts that received some kind of threat uh this morning and after new york city investigated it they deemed it to be non-credible that they're investigating it as a hoax uh and that classes are going to continue in new york i i was interested uh at brian in, in what you said which is very is something that our audience should understand as well that la is is very spread out. Uh, New York is very densely populated, and the island, even though it appears big, is actually very, very small. It's much probably it's probably easier to deploy police resources, law enforcement resources, to ferret out these threats here in New York City, and they might perhaps be in L.A. Oh, yeah. New Manhattan is only 24 square miles. New York City is about 303 square miles, depending on how you count the water. But in any event, uh, bottom line is 720 square miles is the city of L.A. So you're talking about an area that's twice uh, as large and certainly not as densely populated. All right. Looks like we lost Brian, uh, but we still have our, our former FBI agent Stephen uh, uh, with us on the phone uh, there. Uh, Stephen, so uh, that that question, Stephen Moore, the the idea that uh, perhaps there were these numerous threats that were sent to various school districts uh, across the country, this coming from New York City officials, uh, and that at least here in New York City, in Manhattan, uh, in the five, uh, the, the, the five boroughs here, that that was deemed non-credible and perhaps even a hoax, whereas in L.A., perhaps off the back of what we've seen in San Bernardino, perhaps because of the environment that we're living in right now, uh, this is only some 60 miles away from San Bernardino, I'm told. Uh, that we're that we're seeing a reaction the way that we're seeing. Yeah, I think um, I would be very curious to find out if this was a blanket threat to all American schools or or major American schools. I mean, with the internet, I could I I can sit over in Dubai or in even in Syria and figure out um, how to send uh, how to send a threat that would affect seventy percent of all the kids. Uh, in, in the country, and I could probably do it in less than an hour. Um, we, we had a series of, of, of anthrax threats, I remember, about a decade ago, and it was closing down L.A. every single day because all of our fire resources were jumping from source to source to source. And finally, we just had to say, you know what, we're not going to do this. We've never found anthrax in these things. And you come to a realization that you're going to have to live with a certain amount of insecurity. And if, if as Brian said, uh, and I agree with him, 99% of these things are hoaxes, at a certain point, you have to say, uh, we just can't take away the education of these kids on the 1% chance that uh, this, threat is, uh, this threat is real. And I, it's just interesting to me, uh, Stephen, I'm looking now at the comments that uh, uh, New York City uh, Mayor Bill de Blasio made uh, just moments ago, and it says, based on the information that we have, this was a very generic piece of writing sent to a number of different places simultaneously and also written in a fashion that suggests that it is not plausible, and we've come to the conclusion that we must continue to keep our school system open. Uh, in fact, it's very important not to overreact in situations like this. Those are the words of Mayor Bill de Blasio on our WCBS News website here in New York City. So, so again, just, just the idea that one big uh, uh, mayor in this country is saying, yeah, we received a threat similar to the one that was received in L.A., and in that case, it was deemed uh, uh, not credible, and yet in L.A., uh, you're seeing a very different reaction. Yes, and we don't know exactly what the two, what the um, what the content of both of them were. But when I when I was investigating Al Qaeda, I can tell you that a day didn't go by that I wasn't dealing with major threats that were coming in. And there, 
you have people have no idea how many of these threats come in every day. And you have to get to a point where you simply say, I mean, you triage these things every single day. You say, is this one critical? Is this one, is this one credible? Is this one specific? That's the other thing you look for is specificity. You, you know, when you say this school at this time, the bomb is under this building, you know, that kind of stuff, that's, that's huge. That's credibility and specificity. And again, without knowing what LA's got, you have to get to a point where you just say, boom, I'm not doing this anymore. All right, Brian uh, Levin from Cal State San Bernardino Criminal Justice Department. And uh, Steve Moore, former FBI agent. Gentlemen, thank you. Thank you. Anytime. Let's reset for our viewers. If you're just joining us, we are following this story of some threats that were made, a threat that was made to the Los Angeles School District uh, in the wake of the San Bernardino shooting just uh, weeks ago. Uh, the Los Angeles Unified School District receiving this threat, uh, closing down all the schools, affecting 700,000 students. It is the second largest school system in the country. We're talking about 900 schools, 187 public charter schools, a district that is spanning 720 square miles. So a massive, very, very rare uh, occasion to close down these schools amidst this threat. Now, this threat uh, was described as an electronic threat that uh, targeted, uh, that mentioned schools within the district. Uh, we're hearing now from uh, the Associated Press that it may have been an email that was sent to uh, a board member, and there's a possibility that it came from outside of the country. All the schools have been shut down, and uh, police officials are going through the schools searching to make sure that each building is is clear. The school buses were told to return to the yard, so a lot, a lot of children never even got on the school bus to, to get to school. Parents have been told, and they're arriving at uh, different locations, including schools, to pick up their children. It's still really early, and really figuring out what this is all about is still just happening. We're going to head uh, to uh, Ben Tracy. He's standing by. He's in Los Angeles. Ben, what can you tell us? I'm down at the uh, Los Angeles Public School District headquarters in downtown Los Angeles, where we're expecting officials here to brief us in about another hour. Uh, they had originally planned to have that news conference going on now. They recently delayed that for about an hour. Obviously, they're still trying to gather information. I can tell you what I'm seeing down here is a lot of LAUSD employees who work at the central office here who appear to be going home. Uh, there is not a heavy police presence here, but with all the schools shut down, obviously some folks don't have the work they thought they would be doing today, so they're heading home. Um, as you mentioned, this threat came in this morning. We are told it came in electronically directly to a member of the LAUSD board. Uh, the, the Associated Press, as you've said, has uh, said that this came from overseas. Now, obviously, with what you've been reporting, that there might have been threats to school districts across the country, that takes on a very different tone if it's not just specifically Los Angeles. What we don't know at this hour is what connection, if any, those various threats have. Obviously, here with San Bernardino, which is just about 50, 60 miles down the freeway, it's a very diff different atmosphere right now. So you keep, you keep hearing the officials here say, out of abundance of caution, we are shutting down the schools. And I think that caution, obviously, is justified given what has recently happened very nearby here. So the searches of these schools is going on. This is a daunting task. You are talking about 900 schools, 187 charter schools. So this will be a big task today. We, we have heard anecdotal reports that the, uh, the process of reuniting students with their parents, students who had already left for school in the morning or walked to school, has actually gone pretty well. And, and that's amazing considering you know, you're talking about 640,000 students here. So, so far, so good in terms of students being reunited and finding their way back from these schools. But there's still a lot that we don't know, and hopefully in the next hour or so we'll learn some more. Yeah, Ben, and uh, you're there on the ground. Uh, I know you've been talking to us, and you're also doing some reporting for CBS, the Net CBS News Network. Uh, but uh, have you been able to talk to any parents or any of the students that, uh, that are now no longer able to go to school? I have not. I'm here at the headquarters, which is in downtown L.A., which is not at a particular school, so I'm not where any parents or students will be. I can tell you I have seen those interviews on the local news, and I've heard them on the radio, and you have parents who are understandably uh, concerned and worried about their students, and, you know, this is a logistical nightmare when you talk about students getting on buses in the morning or walking to school and then finding out when they get there that there's no school. Most parents are at work. Uh, district officials here have 
publicly pleaded with employers and said, please be flexible today if your employees can't come in because they have to go and get their children. This is, uh, you know, you'd have to go pretty far back in history to some of the anthrax scares that happened here to find anything that uh, parallels this in terms of shutting down the entire school district. Ben, I want you to stand by because uh, Chris Martinez is actually out in front of a school. Uh, Chris, I don't know if you got a chance to speak to uh, parents. How are they reacting? And Maria, I can tell you that, you know, it's it's about nine o'clock in the morning here in L.A. We were here by about eight o'clock and already at eight o'clock, this school was completely empty. No students, no teachers, no parents. We we did speak uh, 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 with a couple of parents here um, uh, earlier. I should say one of our other crews did. Uh, and they mentioned that they were they were nervous. They were a little scared by what was happening here. Uh, and of course, this certainly throws a wrench in everyone's day because it was so sudden having to figure out what to do with your kids. But I can tell you that it was very, very quickly, very quickly, this was uh, this was empty. Uh, so certainly the message is out there. Um, we've not seen a lot of kids walking around the neighborhood here. Uh, so it does appear that people got the message uh, uh, relatively early as soon as it went out. Um, but what is uh, what's in, what's interesting to us is how, how quiet it is here. Now, this is one of the schools that uh, uh, presumably will be inspected at some point today. Uh, but we've seen absolutely no activity here at this point. And so, and so, Chris, I mean, something that Ben was just talking about, the logistics in carrying out this search uh, across uh, 720 square miles, all of those lockers, all of those schools uh, that have to be yeah. searched. Uh, are you seeing any kind of massive police presence at the school that you're at? You know, we've seen one police car here with one officer uh, so far. Uh, but yeah, this is huge. We're talking about more than 900 schools that have to be inspected. We're talking FBI, LA County Sheriff's, LAPD. Um, we're in North Hollywood, which is north of Los Angeles, not too far north, but just north of the city. Uh, so we're not entirely sure at this point, uh, logistically, if they are necessarily starting in one area and, and fanning out and moving around. Um, but we haven't seen a major law enforcement presence here yet. And what's unclear is when it comes to these searches, are you going to see a massive law enforcement present or are you going to see maybe perhaps one or two uh, police officers or sheriff's deputies per school? That much isn't clear. You know, we do uh, have a press conference uh, uh, coming up here, I think in about an hour or so. It was pushed back uh, from school officials and we're uh, hoping maybe to get a, a little bit more insight into how they're going to pull this off. Uh, and, you know, you have to imagine this is going to take probably all day, possibly into the night. It is an absolutely massive undertaking to inspect all of these schools in this district. And especially if you're talking about, as you mentioned, checking every locker, checking every room, checking every nook and cranny of these schools, uh, it's a lot. And, uh, you know, they've been talking about getting everything wrapped up today and, and schools open by tomorrow morning. We're going to have to see if that's possible with a search this big. Yeah, I found that surprising when I heard the, the superintendent say that, considering mm. the number of schools that they have to go through, not to mention the charter schools as well. I, I know you said it's pretty quiet there. I'm wondering if there's a sense of what the general mood is. Are people anxious? Um, how are they dealing with this? Well, you know, I think that it's not necessarily uncommon for there to be threats made against schools uh, across the country anymore. And, and in fact, we've seen a couple of schools in our area here on lockdown uh, this past week, a couple of individual schools uh, based on some individual threats. Uh, certainly it's unprecedented to have this entire district shut down this way, but uh, you do sort of get the sense that while parents perhaps get a little nervous, there is a little bit of expectation with this anymore. Uh, it doesn't necessarily catch people totally off guard to hear that there's a threat made uh, uh, and, and to hear a school in lockdown or, or something is shut down. Now, being that we are as close as we are to San Bernardino, I do think that it hits a little bit closer to home uh, for folks here because, uh, you know, what happened on December 2nd was just about 50, 60 miles from here. So certainly the shooting there uh, maybe raise the awareness a little bit more for people here in terms of uh, something like uh, like this, something, some sort of terror act or some sort of uh, act of violence happening near where they live. Um, but in terms of panic or anything like that, we're not seeing that at all. I think what you have are some parents that just want to know 
what this is all about. They want to know if this is real or not, and they want to know if it's safe to send their kids to school. Chris Martinez reporting for us outside of a school in Los Angeles. Chris, we thank you. Let's get back to Ben Tracy. He's on the phone joining us from the headquarters of the L.A. School Board. Chris. Yeah, Vlad, Sorry, I Ben. Add Sorry, one. Ben. It's been no a long problem. day. <laughs> I can just add one piece of information to uh, the logistics of all this. The mayor of Los Angeles, Eric Garcetti, just announced that countywide, all buses and trains will be free today for LAUSD students. And that obviously is an effort to get some of these students back home or away from these schools, students whose parents are not able to come pick them up. So they are pretty much doing everything they can here to ensure that students are not just hanging out outside these schools. And anecdotally, what Chris was just telling you and what we have heard at other schools is so far that's not a problem, that most of these students either got the message before they left or they've been reunited with their parents. Uh, the district was stressing early today that parents had to bring proper ID to be reunited with their students. Obviously, you can imagine some of the problems that could result uh, in a situation like this. So in about 45 minutes, we're expecting another briefing from officials here at headquarters, and uh, we should know more. It will be interesting to find out from them if they are aware of the threats that have made against LAUSD, if those are tied to the same threats made in New York and potentially other school districts across the country. Yeah, that is an interesting uh, question, Ben, uh, given that you would wonder if the big New York, the big mayors of this country, of the big cities, I should say, uh, do talk to each other, especially in the environment that, that we're in right now, if they communicate with each other when these kinds of things happen, uh, either just to get some insights or perhaps to see if there's anything that is being done on their end to provide some, some guidance. Well, and one can assume that that's the very question the FBI is trying to figure out right now. If this was a blanket threat to major school districts in the country or to every school district in the country, that's a very different thing than it just being this school district and a very specific threat. So we'll have to find out uh, if that is the case. And we just received a little bit of additional information about the threat. Apparently, law, uh, law enforcement sources telling us that the threat was emailed to several L.A. school district board members. And at least uh, some of those emails may apparently be publicly accessible. So I'm not sure where, if that means that it was on a more, uh, the emails were on a more public site, like a social media site, or what that is. I'm sure we'll get details uh, once the press conference occurs. But, uh, you know, Ben, I asked Chris about the general mood, and I want to ask ask you that as well about the general mood considering the difference the difference in the way the New York uh, Police Department has reacted to this versus what's happening in LA and you know since the San Bernardino shooting just how tense are people yeah you know we're, we're, we're speculating here but I think you have to assume that had this happened pre San Bernardino there may have been a different response it is just a different mind frame here right now since that has happened and given how recently that happened. So if this does turn out to be, and we, we don't know this at this point, if this does turn out to be the same threat that New York got and you see a very different reaction, I think that would help explain why LAUSD is reacting the way they are. But we should caution that at this point, we do not know if those threats are connected or if the threat here is an isolated one on its own that they believe is very credible, and so they took this step. Um, I can tell you, walking into headquarters just a couple of minutes ago, uh, you don't get the sense that people are, are, are freaking out. There's not a heavy police presence. There are some district officials who are standing around. Um, obviously, the folks in charge are in a meeting right now trying to get as much information they can to give that to to us and their students and their parents in the next 45 minutes. So some of this, I think, will have a clearer picture in the next couple of hours, but it is a very, I think, a very significant development when you talk about the, the, the largest school district in the country, New York City, receiving threats today and that they deem them not to be credible. Ben, I got a question, and this is just uh, asking you, based on your years of experience reporting from uh, Los Angeles, uh, dealing with officials there, elected officials, public officials, I wonder if there was a shot, there was a chance that at this point the officials there were deeming this threat now to be non-credible. In other words, they were ratcheting down uh, the tension. Would they wait for this press conference, do you think, in your experience, or would they, or would they just announce that uh, through the media, through the press, and then have a press conference later on? My guess is if, if they know that at this point, they would come out at this uh, news conference in about 45 minutes, and that would probably be the forum in which they would announce that. They tend to do them in public. 
uh, to try to be transparent. Uh, my guess is the mayor is getting involved at this point, so he may be heading over here to participate in that. Um, but we don't know. You know that there, there's no signs that they're ratcheting anything down. From what we've heard, these searches are happening at these schools. Uh, they've already taken this step to close the school district, and I can tell you from experience that they will not reopen the school district today just because logistically that's just not possible now to get students to school uh, when everyone has been sent home. So I think the earliest you're going to see anyone back at school is tomorrow morning. But as Chris was saying, if they go through with this process of inspecting every single one of these schools, that is a massive thing, and that takes massive manpower um, and that's both Los Angeles Police Department. And we should mention that LAUSD has its own police force. And so presumably they would be involved in those searches as well. All right, Ben Tracy, thank you very much. Uh, we are continuing to cover the uh, closure of all LAUSD United School District schools after learning of a credible threat uh, directed at multiple schools. We're learning that an email was sent to several members of the school board uh, and police uh, chose or police and school district chose to shut down the schools and uh, divert the school buses back to their lots. And currently the threat is being investigated. Officials are searching each and every school. That's what they tell us. Uh, and uh, things are continuing to unfold. We're going to continue to bring you the very latest, but right now we're going to take a quick break. You're watching CBSN. We're back in 90 seconds.